Healthcare across Ontario has been tested as never before over these past two plus years. And in some parts of the province where population growth was already ahead of capacity, acute needs have residents calling for action. Brampton in Peel region is one such area. It's just landed a new medical school and is hoping to add a hospital. With us now for more, in Kingston, Ontario, Natalie Mera. She's executive director of the Ontario Health Coalition. In Brampton, Ontario, Rowena Santos, regional councillor for Brampton Wards 1 and 5. And in the provincial capital in North Toronto, there's Dr. Lawrence Lowe, medical officer of health for the region of Peel. And we're delighted to have all of you on our program tonight for this look at one of the fastest growing parts of our province. And to that end, uh, let's just start here with a comment from... Prabhmeet Sakaria. He's the president of the Treasury Board, cabinet minister in the current government. He's the MPP for Brampton South. And he says, as it relates to the new Ryerson University School of Medicine to be built in Brampton, after years of chronic staffing shortages, budget cuts, and neglect from previous governments, Brampton's new medical school will give eager students of today the opportunity to become skilled doctors serving our community tomorrow, improving access and quality of care for all Bramptonians. Let's get you all on the record as to what you think about the advisability of doing this. Rowena Santos, what say you? Well, we were very excited and welcomed the announcement. The city of Brampton has not only declared the health care emergency during this term and even despite the COVID-19 before COVID-19, but also we've been advocating for far more post-secondary opportunities here in the city of Brampton. And so the medical school does both of those things. And so we welcome that announcement very much. Natalie Mayra, what do you say about it? I think it's great. I mean, if it happens, because Brampton has been used kind of as a political football, really, for years now. I mean, it, this is not just this government, but many, you know, preceding elections. There have been all kinds of promises for things for Brampton, including a new hospital over and over again, a full service hospital and the like that have not materialized. So, yes, great news, but it better happen. Brampton deserves it. Rowena Santos, let me follow up with you on that because you well know that lots of politicians have taken lots of trips to Brampton to make lots of announcements promising lots of things and a lot of them have not happened and do not happen. How are you so sure this one is going to? Well, I think that uh, folks are right. Like the city of Brampton has kind of been used as the place to make announcements during election time. But then once folks are in government, um, we don't necessarily see the shovels in the ground. We've suffered through decades of being chronically underfunded in the city of Brampton. And to your point, Steve, you mentioned earlier, the city of Brampton is the fastest growing city in the country and the ninth largest. And in terms of per capita funding on health care, we are there are municipalities that get a thousand dollars more than what Brampton gets. And so we have been chronically underfunded for decades. And while we welcome this announcement, especially during the looming of an election again, um, we, we really hope, we hope that we get some attention and shovels in the ground this time around. Well, okay, I'm going to press you on that a little further, because as you point out, we are two months plus to an election. How do you know this isn't just somebody trying to get a good headline in advance of the upcoming election? Well, we know that, for example, two things. We've been pushing for post-secondary opportunities in the city of Brampton, advocating for this entire term, as well as pushing for more health care attention and equitable funding in the city of Brampton as well. Now, the medical school is one thing because the president of Ryerson, Mohammed Lashmi, had already shared that he has been working with the province to make sure that this gets delivered. So you've got the premier, you've got Prabhmeet Sarkaria, you've got... Um, Mohammed Lashmi, the president of Ryerson University, and at the end of the day, we have no choice. The the province, whoever the political stripe of, of government's going to be after the election, they have to do something about health care in Brampton. We are already behind, and I know that uh, we're probably going to talk about the announcement of the hospital, the second hospital as well, but we're already behind. We should already be looking at a third hospital and catching up to what we've already been missing. All right, Dr. Lowe, I've been doing my best not to entangle you in partisan politics here because you are an independent public servant. So uh, having said that, I want to uh, bring up a population chart here and just show everybody uh, in numbers what we've been talking about. And for those who are listening on podcast, I'll just describe this a little bit. This is what the forecast for population in Brampton is expected to be towards the year 2051. 
Uh, we go back to just 20 plus years, and the population of Brampton was somewhere between three and 400,000, and it has been going up and up and up and up every year. And if the forecasts continue along the current trajectory, Brampton's going to be up close to a million people within 30 years. Uh, that's a big city, a million people. So my question is, how much, in your view, Dr. Lowe, have health care resources been able to keep up in Brampton with that population growth? Well, I mean, I think you've heard from uh, Natalie and from Councillor Santos just around the challenges that have existed in Brampton and throughout the region of Peel. And we saw a lot of that on display, I think, throughout the, uh, the course of the pandemic. Uh, you know, much of uh, the reason why we had to uh, implement measures uh, more stringently in the community uh, was because we do have a larger population, but we also don't have as much in the way of uh, both public health funding per capita uh, to support the public health unit, uh, but also uh, in terms of the hospital and healthcare system to actually have addressed the individuals when that cascade of severity uh, started to come uh, to come forward. And I think the other thing that the numbers don't necessarily tell, uh, beside the story, so yes, one million is a huge population, but you're also talking about a community that is incredibly uh, socioeconomically and culturally diverse. And that in and of itself just adds layers of complexity to the nature of health issues uh, that both the public health unit and the healthcare system would be confronting. Dr. Lowe, can you talk to us just, um, I know you're not a historian, but you've obviously watched this for a long time. Brampton's got, what is it, six seats? It's usually a big player in the uh, pr provincial government. I mean, it usually votes for the party that's in power. Why do you think it has fallen so far behind over so many years? You know, I, I'm not necessarily able to speculate on the, on the specifics around the seats or the... Um, the distribution, but the reality is, is that uh, you've seen this in many other uh, communities that have a significant population growth. Uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, you know, I pr prior to working in the region of Peel, I also worked as a medical health officer in uh, the city of Burnaby uh, in Fraser Health Authority, just outside of Vancouver. And you do see this pattern outside the uh, across the countries, uh, where you know the cities do get a lot of uh, funding. There's historic, there's highly established uh, social systems and and health systems there. But as people move out of the city to um, to find places that are more affordable and also uh, being drawn out by various cultural communities, uh, you, you get this rapid population growth and, and just really infrastructure that, uh, that doesn't seem to be able to keep pace, whether it's Burnaby or whether it's Brampton. So Natalie, let's understand what that means, because we're talking about a city of nearly 700,000 people right now, and they got one hospital. So what does that mean to members of the community, to patients, to staff, to people who want a career in medicine in Brampton? What does all that mean? Yeah, you know, for a, for a person trying to access healthcare in Brampton, it means extraordinarily long waits in the emergency department. It means every bed in the hospital is full pretty much all the time, and that there are people lined up on stretchers and hallways for days at a time waiting for access to a bed. These are not people who don't need healthcare. If you're waiting on a stretcher in a hospital for a hospital bed, you're very sick indeed, because Ontario overall has the fewest hospital beds per capita of any province in the country and of any of our peer nations. Um, and then Brampton has even less, has about half the hospital beds per capita, just under half that the rest of Ontario has. Like it's been underserved for decades now. And really it means very poor access to even the most vital of care, emergency care, acute inpatient care in the hospital, complex continuing care, mental health care, rehabilitation, all of those things for patients very hard to access, Steve. Well, okay, Rowena, I wanna go back to that political question because as I say, I mean, I've been watching elections in this province for a long time and Brampton usually votes with the government. And there's usually a senior cabinet minister that comes out of Brampton. And yet Brampton, in terms of services, uh, continues to fall behind all the rest of uh, the big populated centers of the province. Any ideas why? Yeah, and you bring up a, a, a number of very important points. And what's interesting about Brampton with the five ridings that we have here in our city is that it's uh, three seats that are with the NDP and two seats that are with the PC government at the moment. And so with the upcoming election, who knows what's going to change? And perhaps that that division or that uh, you know cross section of party lines may be what actually gets the shovels in the ground this time around from the from the provincial government. 
What I will say, in, and, and um, Dr. Lowe brought up some very interesting points with relation to the pandemic and the impact of healthcare during the course of the pandemic. We were already in a healthcare emergency. We declared a healthcare emergency three months before COVID hit. We were already in gridlock in the one hospital that we had in the city of Brampton. What's also interesting about Brampton is because we were so underserviced, we were then also stigmatized as one of the hot spots across the country for COVID. And part of the reason why, and I'll get to my point now, is because of the amount of essential workers that live and work in Brampton. Our workers in Brampton work in logistics, they work in food manufacturing, they work in the trucking industry. And so when people were able to work from home, Brampton workers had to go to work to keep the country moving. And so the stigmatization has impacted um, Brampton's reputation during the first wave of, of 2020 COVID uh, hitting us. And through us yelling and screaming, Mayor Brown was very vocal about it on the news, national news. Through that advocacy, we were able to push for this announcement for the second hospital. And hopefully the government sees that especially given the course of the pandemic. I have also shared publicly as well that what I've seen as a trend, and I'll say it here now, is a little element of structural racism. We are one of the most diverse cities in the entire country, and the majority of our population will be based in the next few years on newcomers. And so I think that that also has some influence over why we haven't received funding. Okay, Natalie, could you follow up on that answer in this regard? There seems to be a bit of a dispute as to whether or not Brampton is in fact getting a new hospital or it's getting a sort of an additional wing to an existing hospital. I think the facts suggest that there's a new inpatient wing being added to Peel Memorial. Construction supposed to begin next year, the whole thing done by 2027. Now, the government of the day portrays that as, quote unquote, a new hospital for Brampton. Others have said, no, it's not that at all. It's an expansion of an existing hospital. What do you say? Well, you know, whether it's an expansion of the existing hospital or a new hospital, I think I care less than, you know, whether or not they Brampton is actually going to get that capacity because and whether or not it's going to be a full service hospital, which is what Brampton needs. So, you know, if they expand the existing Peel Memorial site, OK, fine. Uh, or they build a new hospital. OK, fine. But let's see the actual budget. Let's see the actual commitment to a timeline that makes some sense. Let's see a plan to get to enough beds and services to meet the population need. If all they do, um, and I have to say, Steve, you may remember this too, because uh, I think we did a show around this time. But George, I remember George Smitherman going with five candidates and standing in front of the Peel Memorial site and promising on the eve of an election a full service hospital for Brampton. You know, this has happened over and over and over again. And that was after pressure from a huge march, about 10,000 people that protested uh, about the death of a patient waiting for 22 hours in the emergency department in Brampton, you know, all kinds of really terrible access to health care um, allegations that were being made at that time. And, uh, and so we've heard this before, and yet we still don't have a concrete plan, a com concrete timeline, clarity about what beds we're talking about, because what they need are acute care beds and the longer term, the complex continuing care beds, what used to be called chronic care beds, and mental health and rehabilitation beds. They need the full range of services. If you don't have an emergency department, if you don't have an ICU, if you don't have a full service lab and all of those things, you can't run all of those services in a hospital. And what you're talking about is kind of ALC beds, so sort of glorified long-term care beds, but not inpatient beds for a range of services. So that's what I'm worried about. I'm worried that there's a lot of kind of manipulative language here, um, you know, kind of opaqueness around what the actual promise is. And we've been pushing very hard for clarity about what is being promised when. Uh, and, so, you know, the firmest promise we can get for Brampton because they are so far behind. It's just a travesty what's happened there. Okay, a couple of things before I get Dr. Lowe to finish up on, uh, follow up on that rather. ALC, alternative level of care, is that what you're referring to there? Yes, okay. And George Smitherman, just to remind everybody, he was health minister during the Dalton McGinty years. That was the incident you referred to there. 
Uh, Dr. Lowe, can you help fill in any of the blanks that uh, many people seem to have about whether this is a, a new hospital or an addition to an existing hospital and what services, regardless, will or will not be there? You know, honestly, I, I think the uh, any any sort of expansion of healthcare capacity uh, in uh, the region of Peel will certainly help to shore up. Uh, you know what what really presented a significant uh, issue in terms of the foundation of our pandemic response, as Councillor Santos identified. Uh, you know, we throughout the uh, course of the COVID nineteen pandemic uh, really saw and laid bare uh, the inequities and disparities that have existed in the healthcare system. Uh, so, you know, again, going back to what Natalie was saying, as long as we're we're getting uh, you know that additional capacity to be helpful, uh, it's worth reminding though, uh, you know, it, I, that. Healthcare and hospitals are really just the start. Uh, as I mentioned as well, one of the other things that we do know as well is that Peel Public Health is the lowest per capita funded health unit uh, in the province of Ontario, uh, and that is again uh, due to the uh, significant population growth that uh, that has occurred. And similar to the hospital and healthcare system, uh, we are going to also need uh, you know additional support as a public health unit uh, in order to both recover from this pandemic response and to be able to really uh, aim for overall health protection and health promotion that will ultimately help to reduce demand and strain on the acute care capacity as well that we do have in our in our community. Councillor Santos, what's your understanding of what's being planned? Yeah, so um, at the city of Brampton, I'm currently on break from a council meeting where later on we're going to be discussing how we're going to make up for our local share owing to the building of the hospital. And, um, you know, one of the big challenges, uh, I think, which is also unfair, is the fact that municipalities in particular are expected to come up with 10% of the funds to actually build a hospital. And uh, from the pers my perspective, I think that it's owing to Brampton that the province do a lot more um, than just expect Brampton to now come up through property taxes, 10% of the share to build the hospital. So I think we have a funding issue as well when it comes to, to the province. We need to make sure that municipalities aren't using the property tax base to pay for hospitals, which are massive infrastructure projects, which quite frankly should be going to Peel Public Health and, and supporting regional Peel Public Health issues, not building massive infrastructure projects that are the responsibility of the province. Can you just, uh, can you do a fact check with me on that? Is that a new provision requiring municipalities to come up with 10% of the capital cost for hospitals? I wasn't aware of that. It's an expectation of us, that's for sure. And so we have been going back and forth, Dr. Lowe knows this as well, between the city and the region to come up with $125 million at the local level, whether that's made up from Brampton or from the region, there's this expectation that the local municipalities will fund 10% of it. Um, and so, you know, let's upload those downloads again. The, the residents' property taxpayers are, 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 aren't able to afford um, the massive costs related to, again, a project that's the responsibility of the province. Natalie, 125 million bucks on property taxpayers. Is that who should be paying for that? No, and I mean, especially in Brampton, because remember Brampton, part of the reason why the uh, redevelopment of the Peel Memorial, which was supposed to happen more than a decade ago, hasn't happened is because Brampton was the experimental site of the first privatized P3 hospital. And I don't wanna take away anything from what Rowena said about you know, kind of racism in public policy, or at least not paying attention to the needs of diverse communities. Because there's, you know, you can see Oakville has a new hospital, Vaughan has a new hospital, Brampton has been waiting all along without access to services with terrible, you know, falling further and further behind. You know, these things shouldn't be political footballs. Uh, they shouldn't re depend on who you vote for at all, and they don't. Uh, you know, I think that's a really dangerous thing to say. But the $125 million to be raised by the community has more than been raised before because the cost of the first hospital, which was a privatized P3, went through the ceiling. I mean, it was supposed to be $250 million, then $315, then $325. Ultimately, it ended up around $650 million for that hospital. It shrunk in size because the costs escalated so much, and then it ate up the Peel Memorial redevelopment, and, and the community never got the second hospital. Brampton has more than paid. As I recall, I think Brampton raised something like $250 million for that first hospital. They could have paid for it all, with you know, 
themselves without ever going to the province. They shouldn't have to pay a cent. <laughs> and on principle, this policy of 10% local share, it doesn't, it's harder on communities that are poorer. It's bad policy. Well, let me pick up on that with Dr. Lowe. Uh, it, it is an empirically provable fact that the population of Brampton uh, has a significantly higher percentage of racialized Ontarians uh, than most places in the province, maybe than any other place in the province. Do you think that you can draw a direct line between that fact and the fact that it has received such a disproportionately less amount of funding for its health care? Well, I don't think you can necessarily uh, draw that direct line, uh, you know. But I think the the bigger point that you're making, though, is uh, that a lot of the uh, a, a lot of the diversity, a lot of this uh, really uh, complex uh, situation that we have in Brampton and in the region of Peel uh, owes to the fact that uh, there are a lot of inequities uh, and disparities uh, that exist. That's why health equity uh, is a strategic priority for uh, our, our public health unit here at Peel Public Health. Uh, that's why we also recognized. Uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that ultimately it wasn't uh, that the pandemic created these inequities or disparities. Uh, they're the same health inequities and disparities that we saw even prior to the pandemic. Uh, many of these groups uh, face uh, higher rates of chronic disease, higher rates of mental illness, higher rates of uh, you know injuries uh, that are all related to the socioeconomic and uh, ethnocultural diversity that we have uh, in our community. And so I think uh, that really speaks to, uh, you know, what, what I always what I always say is that I think the, the pandemic really uh, it just uncovered, uh, you know, these inequities and disparities and put them in the spotlight. And how interesting it is that it is a disease that spreads from person to person that needs that, that reminded us all that we're ultimately all connected. And ultimately, this is a community uh, that we do need to come together for. OK, but Rowena, I don't want to put words in your mouth here, but I really do think it's important to nail this down. Are you alleging that multiple governments over multiple decades have essentially taken a racist view in health care funding because Brampton has received disproportionately less money than other big cities in the province. I think, you know, to Dr. Lowe's point, I, I don't think that there's any research paper or study that makes that direct correlation per se, but anecdotally, um, you can see the inequities and, you know, the diversity that exists in Brampton, the socioeconomic status that residents have here in Brampton. And so there is, um, you know, if someone were to do a PhD or take a look at the racist angle or possible systemic racism that may exist with the chronically underfunded after many decades, on healthcare funding in the city of Brampton, then perhaps they may come to that conclusion. But I'm not prepared to do my PhD just yet. Um, <laughs> but maybe if I do, I'll consider doing something along those lines. And I hope maybe another student may, may consider that as well. Well, it's interesting. One of your Brampton MPPs, Sarah Singh, was actually in the middle of doing her PhD at Ryerson uh, when there was a little thing called an election that happened and she won and she had to put that on hold in order to assume her role as an MPP at Queen's Park. Uh, Natalie, you don't have to do your PhD with us right now, but I would like to give you a chance to explain why the number of hospital beds per 1,000 people in Ontario on average is 2.16, and in Brampton, it's 0.96, less than half. What contributes to this disparity, in your view? You know, I think you're right, Steve, to try and pin this down, because I think it matters. Like, health planning should be based on need. It shouldn't be based on politics. It shouldn't be based on the loudest voices, the people that have the biggest sense of their personal rights, you know, that kind of thing. I think there is a kind of system systemic racism that happens in healthcare with access to services. You, If you were to ask any Indigenous community or First Nations community in Ontario, they would laugh at the question. You know, I, it's absolutely clear. I think when it comes to low-income neighbourhoods, to, um, to communities uh, like Brampton that have been so severely underserved, or even places like Scarborough, where we see real, you know, um, falling behind in terms of improving the hospital um, infrastructure, uh, I have not done my PhD on it, but I have been a very close observer for more than 20 years. And I would say that those more well-to-do communities, which also happen to be whiter, um, have gotten uh, more, 
than those communities that haven't. And, you know, that is a systemic kind of racism, at least in its effect. Um, and I don't want to be afraid to say that. I think it's true. I say this also because I'm half Indian. <laughs> I'm white as, I'm so white, I'm transparent. I'm almost green. <laughs> but uh, but my father is from India. And, I, you know, it's a heartfelt uh, feeling in the community um, that they have been looked over partly uh, due to the racial makeup of the community. You know, it's funny. We've had you on this program numerous times, and it never occurred to me that your last name is your last name uh, because you have a South Asian father. Okay, we learn new things every day. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. Dr. Lowe, let me get you back in here. Uh, in the year 2020, Brampton City Council declared a health care state of emergency due to so-called hallway medicine, right? There were lots of overcrowding, there were excessive wait times and so on. Uh, here we are two plus years later. Can you tell us whether things are any better? Well, you know, I, I, clearly we've all gone through two of the most difficult years uh, within the public health and healthcare space, uh, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I think I'd be hard pressed to say that things are uh, better, um, you know, but I think the reality is uh, it, it really speaks to the need for us to uh, take a look at the investments, uh, you know, in public health, in social services, in healthcare that really support this because we know that health, right, is uh, ultimately uh, beyond just uh, what happens within the hospital and healthcare, those are though those are essential, critical services that happen. It is a full cascade from uh, everyone's day-to-day -day life and their ability uh, to make healthy choices, their ability uh, as they're supported by the system, and you know as addressing some of those uh, broader um, inequities and disparities uh, to ensure that they can live uh, their healthier, he they can live healthier for longer. Um, and then, of course, with those investments in health and social services in the upstream. You're really trying to reduce demand on the downstream, but you also need to make sure that in the downstream and, you know, when you get to uh, needs for uh, hospital care, for treatment, for et cetera, that there is actually uh, something that is also meeting what is the anticipated that need that cannot necessarily be diverted uh, by ensuring that a broader, healthier context is also being built at the same time. In which case, Rowena, take us a decade down the road. Uh, there have been promises for this new wing on the Peel Memorial, new hospital, new wing, call it what you want. Uh, there are promises now of a new medical school uh, for uh, the city of Brampton as well. Take us a decade down the road and, and paint us a picture of what you imagine this city will be like a decade from now when presumably, you hope of course, these two major institutions are completed. Yeah, I think uh, the, the picture that I will paint is healthy that all of our residents are healthy, that the hallway medicine issue that we have still existing in the city of Brampton will be gone, that we will actually have a cancer care treatment center um, that is uh, is helping cancer patients here in Brampton so that our residents don't have to travel elsewhere in order to get their cancer care, and that we are starting to build our third hospital in the city of Brampton. And on top of that, we now have 10 years down the road, more doctors and nurses to actually staff the hospitals themselves. Dr. Lowe, uh, we've just heard something new being added to the wish list here, the Cancer Care Treatment Center. Does Brampton need one of those? Well, uh, you know, again, this is probably something uh, better answered by my healthcare colleagues, but I think uh, many, uh, many large centers around the province all have regional cancer centers, uh, and those are uh, critical uh, both from a prevention aspect in terms of, uh, in terms of addressing uh, the detection of cancers early, and uh, and then of course treating cancers uh, that have progressed to uh, to different stages. So, uh, if it's not something that's uh, that that exists in Brampton right now, then it certainly is something that uh, would would help to. Uh, to contribute to the overall health and well-being in the community. Natalie, how about you? Take us a decade down the road. What do you see if everything comes according to Hoyle the way that Rowena hopes it does? I also hope to see that Brampton has you know, at least it's two full service hospitals and is working on the third. I think the Cancer Treatment Center is absolutely fair and just to call for. You know, Kingston has one. It's uh, got a medical school. It's about 120,000 people. You know, there, Brampton is one of the largest cities in the country. It's not just one of the largest cities in the province. Um, and there are many smaller cities that have more services. It would make sense to attach a medical school to more of those services. So I hope to see Brampton as kind of a healthcare hub for its region and that we have turned, finally turned the corner on austerity and cuts and privatization that we're in a kind of 
nation building period again, and that Brampton gets to be kind of at the forefront of that with a with a model of care and services that is modern, that is diverse, that respects the cultures and diversities of the community. I think Brampton could lead in that, could be kind of a center of excellence for that, for um, the country and for the world, actually. I'd love to see that. Gotcha. I want to thank the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views. From left to right on our screen, Rowena Santos, the regional counselor in Brampton, Dr. Lawrence Lowe, the medical officer of health for the region of Peel, Natalie Mayra, executive director, Ontario Health Coalition. Thanks to the three of you. Be safe out there, everyone. Thank, thank you, you, Steve. Thank you so much, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.